I have is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And a lot of you know this. But I like to read it how my mom taught me to read it when I was little. You change love with God and you change it with he. So we'll read like this. God is patient. God is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude and he is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God never fails. And I feel like just today, this Sunday, that we should worship him and just love on him and honor him with everything we do and give him our whole heart. Just, just give it all to him. We just give them all to it. It's like when you really love someone and you, or your child or something like that, you want to give them the all. You want to give them the best. And that's how he is with us. He just wants to give us all. And in return, we should give him just the same, our best, and honor him with everything. So I pray, God, we love you so much. And we just want to honor you today, God. And let our hearts just be open to you, God. Because you cleansed us and you made us free and shameless in your eyes. We have done no wrong. How awesome you are and how loving you are towards us, God. So we just worship you with everything we have, everything we are. No matter what we did yesterday or what we're doing today or what we're doing tomorrow, God, you just love on us no matter what. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. Every knee we will bow to the Who we'll come to the altar, the Father's arms in this day just like you said you would there's a fire stirring in our bones our shadow is rising rising up inside so How's everyone doing this morning? You doing good? Yeah? You ready for the Word of God? Amen. So as we are getting into the Word of God, I like to encourage again once in a while uh, just to, to limit your uh, uh, movements. And uh, I know that some of you need to use the restrooms, and that's fine. Um, but just to honor the Word of God when it's being preached, try to limit uh, movements in the house of God, at least for during that time. So, praise the Lord. Uh, let's turn uh, to the book of Romans, chapter 12, and we'll get started here. Romans, chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Amen. Look like the, uh, the hot days are here. Amen. So we're reading out of our text, Romans, chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. And it reads like this. This is the uh, King James Version. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed, and, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, everybody say transformed, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove 
what is that good? Everybody say good. An acceptable and perfect will of God. So I title this message, The Good Life. My theme is discerning God's perfect will. Discerning God's perfect will. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you that we have the privilege to, to serve you, Lord, and, and uh, to worship you and to bless you. We thank you for all that you are and for all that you do. I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will just fill our hearts and that, Lord, that we would understand the Word of God and be transformed by the Word of God be transformed by your grace, by your presence in a powerful way this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, we, are, we all come into this world with uh, the desire to live the good life. The good life message can be found in every TV commercial in every business presentation, in every movie, and of course, that dream vacation. The good life message sells, makes tons of money, and we all buy into it. Isn't that the truth? By the time you hit your senior year in high school, you're already thinking about life, you're already thinking about career, you make a transition to college, you'll begin to line up what you want to do for the rest of your life, and uh, really, the purpose behind all that is so that you can have a good life. Everybody agrees to that? Does anybody have anything against having a good life? Yeah, good life. Amen. You ever seen those commercials? The uh, message, whether it's obvious or hidden, it's ours about the good life. I love those commercials where they are show a beach with a table with two Coronas and two tan bodies. And I'm thinking, the good life. <laughs> you know what I mean? The good life. The Caribbean, Hawaii, whatever it may be. The good life. It's ours a picture of the good life, right? Your dream vacation. Anybody dream about your dream vacation? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is the good life, you know? Unfortunately, the Christian church also bought into this message. Why? Because it attracts the crowd. It makes people feel good. And of course, it's something that, we'll, something that we all want. You know, even when you have commercials that has to do with cars, right? It's ours about the good life. Oh, man, if I could just have that car, I mean, that's, that's the good life. Everything is about the good life. The message is very powerful and makes billions of dollars. We all buy into it because we all want that good life. Amen? The Bible is about the good life, but with a different perspective and interpretation from the world's point of view. And we're going to look into that. The world's interpretation of the good life looks great, it sounds great, but the end result leads to a dead end. Many people who take this path find themselves either broke, <laughs> either broke or rich, right, looking for the good life. Either broke or rich but lack true satisfaction, they still discover an emptiness of the soul. Yet millions pursue this lifestyle in the hope that they will have a sense of meaning and a sense of, sense of purpose. I want to uh, transition here to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. And I know it's uh, a little lengthy, but there's no way around this. I want to be able to read verse 1 through verse 6. So let's make a transition over now to the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Through six. It reads like this Now the serpent was more subtle 
than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth not God doth know that in that day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did, and he did eat. Uh, this is very interesting. You know, I don't know if Eve knew who she was talking to, and sometimes I think that that our conversations, in our thoughts, sometimes we don't know who's talking to us. It could be a serpent, right? Very interesting. There is a tree here that has been forbidden. God has forbidden Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of. But in the course of the conversation, now that tree looks good for food. Suddenly it's pleasant to the eyes, and suddenly it's to be desired. Interesting how conversations can change perspective, can change our minds pretty quick can change the way our eyes look at things and how we understand things, right? It's like a good salesman. No, 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 no. You ever been in those presentations? You tell yourself, no, I'm not going to buy into it. No. And suddenly, it's good. Pleasant to the eyes. <laughs> and it's like uh, to be desired. Yeah, let's buy it. And then after, you, after you've done that, you go like, what did we do that? It's kind of the case here. Amen. The first thing the serpent did was to poison Eve's mind with doubt concerning God's character and his word. The devil will say, you can't trust God. You can't trust his word. You see, the Bible says that the serpent spoke to Eve and said, Are you sure? Are you sure that God said that? And so, you know, Eve responded. And uh, someone goes, no, 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 no. God knows that if you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be, you will receive something better, something greater. The first thing that the enemy often does is to cause us to doubt his character and his word, right? We know that in history, man has always said that this Bible is not God's word, that this is just fiction. But if the enemy can cause you to doubt this Bible and his word, you're in trouble. It's what got Adam and Eve in trouble. Doubt. Anybody that sows seeds and tells you that you can't trust God, trust His nature, and you certainly can't trust the Word, the Bible, you have to watch out. We have to watch out with all the conversations that are taking place in our thoughts and in our hearts. The Bible says that we ought to guard our hearts. Amen? Does this make sense? We have to be careful today. We don't want to be like Adam and Eve. We've seen it once. We have seen it what it has done to this day. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. The second thing the serpent does is offer Eve something better than what she already had. What's in this fruit is far greater than what you have right now. 
Would you like to have it? Let's make a deal. Did you know that there's a show called Let's Make a Deal? It's in the Bible. I told you everything is in the Bible. Even game shows are in the Bible. I think this one the devil created, though. He created Let's Make a Deal. Behind curtain number three would will make you richer. In other words, is you know, now Adam, by the way, was there because Eve said he, she gave it to her husband who was next to her. So the husband was not somewhere far away. He was witnessing the whole scenario as well, right? The head of the home, right? Who's supposed to squash the serpent and took care, should have taken care of that serpent. See, you ain't going to talk to my wife. And you ain't going to destroy what God's given us. Come on, man. Amen. A little slow, but you'll get there. You know? Uh, serpent goes, see this? What's in this is much greater than what you have right now. Eve, Adam, whoa. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Here they are in paradise, right? Everything is made perfect. They're smack in the middle of Waikiki, right? Paradise, everything you could have. But the offer is this. What's in here? You take a bite of this, it's better than what you have. You really want the good life? It's right here, and it's all yours. Would you like to trade what you have with curtain number three? <laughs> Let's make a deal. Would you like to keep what you have or choose curtain number three? Do you want to keep this or want something better? Wow, an offer that cannot be refused. A transaction for better life. It doesn't get any better than that, right? We're all up for a good life, for a better life. Verse 17 says, but, if the tr but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everybody say good. good. Evil. evil. Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die. That's the word of the Lord. You see? And the serpent said, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the word. You won't die. You you're going to have the best, the most powerful, awesome life that one can have by eating the fruit of this tree. Now, what just happened? Huh? What just happened? Adam and Eve ate what is good because that was the presentation. The presentation was that this is good. It's even greater than what you have right now. Everything that God's provided for you, this whole thing, this right here is much greater. You want the good life? It's right here. Adam and Eve ate what is good over the purpose and will of God. This week when I was praying, I heard the Lord say to my heart that the good is distracting my people and leading them astray. Everybody say good. How can good lead us astray? All right? How can the good life take us away from the Lord? It's not always the obvious evil. It's what we call good. It's what we call okay that leads us astray. You see, the Bible says that the serpent is, is the most subtle creature on this planet, smooth, can hardly tell. You can hardly tell the serpent is having a conversation with you, influencing your thoughts, directing you. Very subtle, very hard to discern. Sometimes we focus on what is really obvious and what is really obvious to us as in terms of bad and evil. 
but sometimes it's the good. We choose the good above the will of God. That's an interesting thing. When the Lord spoke to my heart this week, I, I, uh, it opened my eyes as well. Because the good can distract all of us. And the reason why it's so decepting is because we don't see any evil in the good. How can you find evil in the good? But the tree that we're eating from, humanity, the tree that we're eating from is called the knowledge of good and evil. It's very deceiving. It's the good that is distracting us. It's the message of the good life that is leading us down the wrong path. If we eat the good, we must be prepared to accept the bad that comes with it. Adam and Eve certainly thought it was good. Now they have to accept the bad that comes with the good. Cars, airplanes, trucks, buses, are all good ideas, but it also polluted the world, the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. Because we eat from this tree that whatever is good, we have to be willing to accept the bad that comes with it. You ever been to the doctors in the hospital, and they'll say, we'll prescribe you this medication, but the side effects is that it, it may uh, destroy your kidneys, put an end to your liver, and stop your heart. But if you take this medicine, it will help you. It doesn't make sense, does it? Because medication is supposed to help us. It's good. But it comes with side effects. Chemicals, chemistry, drugs. And I'm not saying something, I'm not trying to be negative about the medical world because I believe that God has blessed the medical world to some degree and has helped millions, if not billions of people today. God has certainly used it as a vehicle of mercy and his kindness. But I'm just trying to make a point here. I want us to understand this point. Only God can possess the knowledge of evil and not do evil. If we are injected with the knowledge of evil, we contaminate our whole soul, which means we cannot handle the knowledge of evil. See, because Adam and Eve had no knowledge of evil. They eat the apple, and suddenly it was injected into their bloodstream and into their spirit and soul called the knowledge of evil, and they're fully contaminated now. And with that knowledge of evil in the heart of man, it's impossible for him now to be saved. It's the reason why Jesus came. Because his whole spirit, his whole heart has become wicked. It has contaminated his soul, his mind, his emotions, his thoughts, his imagination, everything about him. It didn't take too long. You find the same story in Genesis. When Adam and Eve had families, they start killing each other already. We had a brother who murdered his own brother. In the first chapter. That's what happens when the knowledge of evil is injected into our system. We were never designed to have that knowledge running through our veins, ruling our hearts and ruling our thoughts. Only God himself can know, knowledge, know and possess the knowledge of evil and not sin and not do evil. We cannot handle the knowledge of evil. We have to be careful because sometimes the enemy tempts us to think that it's okay, we'll do this or that. You can handle. Right? So maybe you had a drug problem in the past. It won't hurt just one more time. I know people personally throughout ministry who had a drug problem and was clean. And they just decided to do it one more time died that day. 
Maybe you had an alcoholic problem, I don't know. The devil will say, you can just do it one more time. One drink won't hurt you. We're forgetting that the knowledge of evil exists in our being. And all it takes is just one more time to get you down the wrong path. Just like that. The power of the serpent, huh? Thank God Jesus came defeated the serpent. If we eat the good, we must be prepared to accept the bad that comes with it. I'm not saying all good ideas are bad. Certainly, God can give us good ideas for the purpose of leading us. Amen? But the point I'm making is when we choose good over God's will, it's a bad idea. Here, Adam and Eve, here's the will of God. Boom! There's a serpent says, I got something good. It's even better than the will of God. And they took it. And look at where it landed us today. Hey, man. I don't know about you, but every morning I got to face sin. I got to battle with sin every day, just like everyone else. Because I know that what was injected in me, I have to deal with. But now I have a greater power, a greater life that is in me. And every day I learn how to live from that life, not the life of Adam and Eve, the fallen Adam and Eve. Come on. Jesus said only his heavenly father is truly good because goodness that comes from God, listen carefully, have no side effects. And Jesus knew that. He had somebody come up to him and and uh, he had a conversation with this person, and Jesus goes, hey, good? Don't call me good. No, he didn't say that. He just said this, good? No, only my heavenly Father is good. He's good alone. Only he is good alone. Only he is good alone. And you can find that in Matthew 10, verse 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one. He said, no one is good except God alone. You see, what we call good in this world has hidden evil attached to it. And the better choice is God's will over what is called good. Sometimes we have good ideas, but they end up drawing us away from God instead of drawing us closer to God. I'm sure you have great ideas. I have great ideas. We entertain great ideas. We come up with good ideas. But before we take a bite of what is good, beware of the possible or hidden evils attached to it. Your plans, my plans, may sound good. But the question is, Is it the will of God? Is it the plan of God? Or is it something, listen, or is it just something that we are planning? Right? Is it just something we are planning? It's the reason we ought to be praying and seeking the Lord at all times, even when it comes to good ideas. Your good idea may come from another source. And you may say, this is brilliant. Now, I know that through ministry, people would say, I have this idea, pastor, this and that. They're no longer serving the Lord. They forgot to ask the Lord whether that was from Him or not. But it was a good idea. But it led them astray, far from the Lord, just like how we see Adam and Eve. There is something better than good. It's called God's will. Everybody say God's will. Discerning the will of God is important in this journey. We need to know the difference between what is good and what is God's will. Otherwise, what appears to be good will deceive us down the wrong path. God will lead us in His goodness 
with no side effects. Anybody want to be led by goodness with no side effects? How would you like to have some medicine from heaven but no, have no ill effects? No other complications. Why? Because God alone is good. And what he releases is good. Because it's pure and it's holy. And it's filled with life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The goal of Christianity is not to be a good Christian. Yet many people are trying to be good Christians. The purpose of the blood of Jesus Christ is not to make us good Christians, but to transform us into the image and likeness of Christ. See, the more we, like, the more we are like Him, the more true goodness follow us. It's true. You don't have to go look for the good, because the more you're transformed into the image and likeness of Christ, the good that you're looking for the good life starts to follow you. And this good that follows you is called God's goodness. It's not like this world. I thank God for technology. I thank God for the internet. But there's a good side and a bad side to it. I love food, but I know because of the process that it goes through, it, there's good, but there's the bad. Come on. We can't escape it because it's a fallen world. That's why we need the goodness of God to follow us wherever we go. And the way the goodness follows us is by being transformed, allowing God to change us. You see, at the end of the day, it's not what we do or what, what we do not do. The end result should always be transformation. Transformation. You Look, I tried to be a good Christian, and maybe you've tried to be a good Christian. I failed every single time. And I said, Lord, I can't be a good Christian. I'm trying to be a good Christian. Then I realized that that was not why Jesus saved me through his blood. It was to transform me. And by being transformed, when my nature begins to change. My character begins to change. And when I become more like the image of Jesus Christ, I realize that goodness begins to follow me. I don't have to chase it down. I have to work so hard to look for that good life because then the good life begins to follow me wherever I am and wherever I go. The good life blesses me because it's coming straight from the Father. And I don't have to worry about God making me sick. Or destroying me. Because his goodness is pure. It's different from this world. It's what we are becoming that matters the most. Not the good we do. We can become good without heart change. Listen, we can be good without a heart change. There are people who do good deeds in this world that do not believe in Jesus Christ, but respect their fellow men. Amen. A lot of good people. Let's look at example, an example in the Bible. It's found in Matthew 23, verse 27. I think we've all come across this verse. It says, woe to you. You know, when Jesus says woe, it's not a good thing. <laughs> you know, Jesus had his slang too. He said, woe. Like, woe. And everyone goes, Whoa. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Word means acting or pretenders. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. These are Jesus' words. So, we're talking about Bible this morning. I want to read this to you, and you can find this in artstudy.wordpress.com. Archaeology, art, and literature as relating, as relating to Bible study. The article is whitewashed, and this was an article written in 2010, but because it's lengthy, I want to read just a small portion of it. So, it reads like this. 
Mankind spends so much time and money beautifying our tombs and gravestones. Perhaps if we attempt to impress on the outside, we'll distract from what is actually happening on the inside. You ever seen the news oftentimes when someone commits suicide and when they talk and interview other people who are familiar with them or friends with them, will say, well, I don't know. They were just as happy as they could be yesterday. I wouldn't know why they would kill themselves today. You see, the inside, it's the inside, that injection, knowledge of evil. But the reality of the grave can't be denied. We attempt to distract from the reality of death and cause others to see the dead as a good person, see the dead as a good person by purchasing an expensive gravestone or a large tomb. Now, I've been to a lot of grave sites in my time, but uh, I've seen some huge monuments. You ever seen huge monuments in grave sites? Sometimes I see just a little something there, and then sometimes I see like it looks like a mansion. You know? Coming from Hawaii, some of the grave sites, you don't have nothing but a stone, maybe. In some places, it's, it's incredible, amazing. It's really no surprise that we do the same thing in our daily life. Shine on the outside to distract from what's happening on the inside. The greatest people group to ever build the most beautiful tomb of all time were the Egyptians. They built the pyramids for their kings. These kings were worshipped as gods and were buried as so. Thousands of years later, their bodies are still there, rotten, crumbling, and dead. Now you understand what Jesus said to the religious people of his day. You're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man bones, rotten to the core. You see, it's easy to do things on the outside and make oneself look good and oppressive. But God is always looking at your heart. He's always looking at your thoughts. He's always looking at your imagination. He's always looking at your intent, your motivation, your desires, your passions. He's not looking at what you're doing. He's looking at why you're doing it. That's how heaven looks upon us. Because anybody could do good on the outside. Jesus called the religious people of his day whitewash. Tombstones, because they focus on appearing good on the outside, doing good deeds, being nice, behaving well, but inside they were filled with uncleanness, with all kinds of impurities. Jesus said we'll be judged by our imagination, the intents of our heart, our motives, our desires that do not line up with his will and plan. Jesus said it was the inside the defiles. And you can find that in Matthew 7 20. He said, No, 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 it's not outside. It's not what you're doing on the outside. I know it's impressive. I know from the outside it's great performance. He said, No, what's killing you is on the inside. What's defiling you is on the inside. What's destroying you is on the inside. That's the reason at the end of the day, really the, the end result should be transformation of the heart. And if you got the transformation of the heart, you don't have to worry about, about whether you're behaving right or not because the trans, transform heart will change your actions. It changes your deeds. It changes your behavior. It changes how you do things. You don't have to try to be a good Christian anymore. You just need a transformed heart. That's what Jesus came for. We can come to church all our lives still unchanged. We can still do the church thing. We can still appear great. But God is always looking at the heart. Because the heart matters to the Lord. You know, if you turn to your spouse, you can say the same thing. 
It's your heart that matters the most. You can turn to your children and remind them that your heart matters the most. You could say to someone who's making millions of dollars and, and they say, well, that could be their success, but really at the end of the day, it's your heart that matters the most. Hallelujah. Amen. I'll come to a close here. You know, it could be so deceiving. Because the good can distract us in that way. And it's difficult because sometimes we don't see sin in the good. Amen? Unless the goodness is coming from the Lord and He's leading you and guiding you in every way. Where our decisions are are led by the Holy Spirit. Why settle for what is good when we can have something better called God's will? Everybody say God's will. God's will is better than what is good. The world is going to always offer you something every day you get up, every day you go to work, every time you watch television. Live your life as you do. The world will all, always offer you something good that you can't, well, it makes it difficult to refuse. But there's something better. It's called God's will. You see, Jesus Christ didn't do something good. What he did was call his Father's will. Listen, it was better than good. And I'm glad that it was better than good. I'm glad that he fulfilled God's will and that he was not just living the good life because it's changed my life. It changed your life. It's changed the world. God's will contains better things than what is found in the good. Good can be greater. Listen, good can be a greater threat than darkness if it leads us astray. Instantly, we may be aware of darkness, but we, not be, we may not be aware of the good that's distracting us. Well, you might say, well, there's a lot of things that are good. There's sports, right? It's not bad. Got all kinds of forms of entertainment. I don't agree with all of them, but there, I'm sure there's something there that we can, that's good, right? Good things can't be bad but that's where the deception is maybe the good maybe sports is is not bad but it could still take your life down the wrong road come on it could still you know this nation has been blessed with sports and we have produced some of the most incredible athletes who have become champions not only this country but around the world. And, and, and that's a good thing. It's not a, a bad thing. But if we're consumed by that and it becomes part of our life and it takes God's place in our hearts, then we have lost. We have lost the point of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If it becomes greater than your dedication and your commitment to the Lord, if it becomes greater than your devotions, if it becomes greater than your worship and you worship uh, sports, then it becomes a stumbling block. How many understand what I'm saying this morning? Good is not always a threat, but it can become our worst enemy. You know, and I, I you know, you, maybe you're like me, but every week I'm very aware. I try to be aware as much as possible of what's going on in me and around me in my daily living. And I'm always looking at ways to adjust, to change, so that at the end of the day the results will be transformation so I could always offer God up worship. Right? Not just singing with your mouth. Everybody can talk. Right? 
but a transformed life being offered to the Lord at the end of the day. And so I'm trying to be always uh, aware of that, aware of what God is trying to accomplish in me, in my heart, in my spirit, in my mind, in my emotions, in my life. And we need to be that way. Good can be very deceptive because we are not aware of hidden, da- hidden danger. How many, well, you guys should know this, especially parents. Kids don't see it. They may say, oh, look, it's good. But you see the hidden, hidden danger. And you say, no, son, that's not good. But, but, but I want to go play. No, it's not good. But I want to eat. No, it's not good. Why? Because we see the hidden danger in what appears to be good. Does that make sense? So when a serpent comes, presents something that appears to be good, how can it be bad? Why? Because oftentimes evil is hidden. We only see what is good and we bite and then we're injected with evil. And then we find ourselves in trouble, struggling our faith, and we don't know why. We don't know that we just got duped by the enemy. Here's the clincher. Many Christians live the good life, but never into the will of God. Never into the will of God. In my experience of years in the ministry, I meet a lot of people from every walk of life, and some of them have some amazing life, good life, good life. They live amazing life, successful lives. But in my spirit, I just know that they've never entered the will of God for their lives. The good life has taken them down. And, and you may have a successful life. And you may have a good life. It doesn't mean you've entered the will of God for your life. Jesus came to the will of the Father. I suppose he could have just lived a good life, right? But the will of his Father was always on his mind. It was always on his heart. In fact, when Jesus, uh, when his disciples asked Jesus how to pray, he said, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will. Thy will. Thy will be done. He said to his disciples, look, everything in the world is going to distract you. But I want you to know that the will of God is important. More important than what is good. Father's will for you, Peter. Father's will for you, John. Father's will for you, James, is important, more important that even what is, even what is what we consider the best that could be offered in this world. Now, I understand that people move in different realms of success, whether it's an athlete, whether it's business, whether it's acting, whatever it is. And if God sends you there, that's your field where you are to make change. He gives you a platform, right? So what he has done in your heart, you can give away. Amen? Don't be consumed with title, position, fame. There's very few people that can handle fame. Don't be cut up with all that kind of stuff. Really, at the end of the day, it's your heart changing. You being transformed. You're not the same as yesterday. You're growing and maturing. You're moving and advancing, moving with the Lord. Amen? Our journey, listen, our journey to heaven is not just about heaven. Our journey towards heaven is about growth. It's about transformation. It's about growing in Christ every day so that when we arrive, we can give our Lord the best that we can offer Him. Amen? 
We have many good Christians but never live out the will of God. We can choose the good life above God's will or we can choose the will of God above what appears to be good or even better. Remember the goal is not to be good Christian but to live a transformed life. A transformed life. A transformed life. You may say, well, Lord, you may say, well, how can I be more committed? How can I be more dedicated? How can I... How can I be more of service? See, you, you'll never get there, and I'll never get there without a transformed heart. Because you being committed and being dedicated requires a transformed heart. You, you have a dedicated, hardworking person, right, who's living for Jesus. Someone that you know that you can count on. It doesn't come easy. It comes because of a changed heart. The reason why it's difficult to get anybody involved in the work of the Lord and the ministry of the Lord or what God is calling us to do, the reason is, is it's because there's no change here. I can't even carry out God's will if I'm really cold here towards Him. If I have one leg in the world and one leg in his kingdom, there's no way I can carry out and be fully committed to the Lord. It, it, it takes us, it takes our whole heart to jump in. It takes a transformed heart. Change. Change. I want to encourage everyone this morning because I know that everyone is in a different place, different place in your walk with the Lord and, and your growth. Some are just starting out. Some are years serving the Lord. How many know that you could serve the Lord for many years and just settle somewhere and stay there? Did you know that when God called Abraham out and said, hey, Abraham, I want you to call, I'm calling you out to a land what's foreign to you but it will become a land that I'll give to your descendants. You know, that call was originally to his dad. His dad received that call. But his dad wanted to settle in a place called, uh, <clears throat> um, what is that? I can't remember the name of the, the country or the region. He just wanted to settle there. And then when God saw that he decided to settle there, then he called his son Abraham and said, Abraham, how about you? I want to call you out. Would you go? And you see, we could serve 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and still not go anywhere when it comes to God's will, God's destiny for our lives, because we just decided to just plot here and stay here. Right? Going to church is just good enough. But there's a will and there's a plan that needs to unfold in our lives, that is very, very powerful. It's the reason why the serpent is always at our heel trying to, to take us down. Let's just stand. Let's stand to our feet.